understand it that well. But I think, you know, you being a professor, you have so much to say. But before we get into our topic, Darian, would you tell us kind of like who you are and what makes you an expert in this topic? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I actually grew up in the Midwest. I'm from Kansas. Uh, so that's right in the middle of the United States. I've been living here in California for the last uh, 15 years or so. Uh, and I uh, grew up not really knowing about the Bible or knowing about uh, uh, Christianity, but I became a Christian when I was young and kind of fell in love with Jesus and began to learn more about him in the New Testament. And so that made me want to study and think more about the New Testament, learn all that I could. So I went on and, and uh, went to a lot of school, uh, got a Ph.D., And I studied the book of James. Uh, that's the book that I did my Ph.D. on. Uh, and then from there, I got a job here at Biola, which is a great place to teach, great people here. And for the last several years, I've been teaching, especially in this area. So James and First and Second Peter, First and Second, Third John and Jude, those seven letters in the New Testament. Uh, I'm, I'm studying them often. I'm teaching them in class. And I'm just really every semester learning more and more. Uh, about these letters. And frankly, as a Christian, trying to live what these ancient letters are telling me about the life of Jesus and how my life should look more like the life of Jesus as well. So that's a little bit about my background. Awesome. I love it from Kansas. And I have your book right here in my hands. It's called Letters for the Church, Reading James, First and Second Peter, First, Second and Third John, and Jude as Canon. Right. And I guess one of the first questions is, I mean, what is a canon? Right. Like yeah. what, what is the Bible or what is the canon? And yeah. how does that That's happen? That's a great question, uh, especially because it's in the title like that. Yeah. And when we think of canon, uh, I, uh, probably a lot of things might come into our mind and and maybe n none of them relevant to uh, to what uh, we talk about when we talk about the New Testament canon. So two, maybe two ways of thinking about this. Number one. In the early church, uh, as Jesus had performed his ministry, he had died, he'd risen again, uh, and then the early church was forming, uh, the early church, they began to write letters and gospels, uh, historical text about the early Christianity, like Acts and uh, Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. And these early books were called canon. They were called canon first because they were authoritative. They were seen as the apostolic or the real teaching about Jesus and about how to understand God's will. So they were authoritative. So the first thing, when you think about canon, it's an authoritative text. So it's a book, a letter, a gospel that has authority, that is speaking on behalf of the teachings of Jesus. Now, a second uh, part of canon is that a canon is like a list. So if you if you ever look at a Bible, you can turn to the very front of the Bible where it says the table of contents, and there's a really specific list of books there, New Testament books and Old Testament books. It's a set list. And so that, that's the second thing to think about canon. Canon is a, a group of authoritative texts in an authoritative collection. Does that make sense? So it's authoritative texts in an authoritative collection. So when, when I'm talking about these letters, James through Jude, as canon, they are a part of that authoritative list right alongside the Gospels and Paul. Mm. That's so good. Yeah. And when I think of, I mean, authoritative, you said the real teachings about Jesus. And I think that's key to me because... One of the things I wanted to to talk with you is, I mean, that's what I was saying at the beginning. Like when we think of Paul, we think, wow, this guy is amazing. He wrote so many books in the Bible and you know, it became the canon, right? But in a sense, he wasn't a disciple of Jesus. Like he wasn't there when he was teaching. He didn't walk right. with him like the three years and see him, you know, witness him going to the cross and all these things. Maybe from a from a distance, right? But But uh, he never appears like in the Gospels per se, like, you know, being under under uh, Jesus' teachings. That's and right. the thing is that uh, some of the some of the apostles, 
that you mentioned here in the letters for the church where like disciples of Jesus, right? So they witness like almost like face to face what it looked like being on the, the real teaching. So can you tell me a little bit about like who these authors were? Like were their disciples, were all of them disciples, were only a couple of them disciples of Jesus? Who are they? Yeah, those are great questions. And like you just said, Paul wasn't one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. Paul doesn't make an appearance in the Gospels uh, because, because he's not a believer in Jesus at that time. But later on, Paul has this experience with Jesus on the road to Damascus that we can read about in the book of Acts. And there he, he comes face to face with the risen Christ. And, and Paul then becomes a great teacher of early Christianity. But Like in the letters that we're looking at today, John and Peter, are, they actually walked with Jesus. They spent three years living with Jesus, walking with him, hearing him teach, seeing him do miracles, seeing people's lives transformed by the power of God through the ministry of Jesus. And so these two disciples, yeah, now write letters, passing on the true teaching of Jesus to the communities, the churches that they were involved in. Interestingly, though, when you think about James and Jude, they're writing letters here as well. They weren't disciples of Jesus. In fact, we know a little bit about their lives. Uh, James and Jude uh, refused to believe that Jesus was the Messiah while he was teaching, while he was doing his ministry. We know that because James and Jude are brothers, and they're brothers of Jesus. What? Uh, and, and, and we learn from the Gospels that the brothers of Jesus had a really hard time believing Jesus' claims. That's actually kind of encouraging to us today, I think. The very brothers of Jesus, they grew up with him. They saw him when he was little. Uh, they interacted with him before his public ministry. They, they were hesitant. They didn't believe in Jesus while he was uh, ministering on earth. But we learn later in the New Testament that both James and Jude become believers in Jesus later, after his death and resurrection. And especially James, he becomes a really important part of the early church. So yeah, that's a little bit about these four Uh, authors that write these letters that I'm thinking about in this book. Awesome. So we have John and Peter. I mean, they were with Jesus as he's doing ministry. In fact, I mean, not to interrupt, but I mean, in fact, uh, when you read the Gospels, Jesus talks about three of his disciples in many situations. They're kind of like the inner three. I mean, all 12 disciples are beloved by Jesus and spent time with him. But Peter, James, and John, those three disciples, they went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw Jesus in his glory. They prayed longer with Jesus in the garden before his death. So notice, uh, John and Peter, they, they weren't just 12, a part of the 12 disciples. They were, they were uh, watching and a part of all of Jesus' ministry in an intimate kind of way. So they're like very, very close to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so cool. So they were super close to Jesus. And I mean, what strikes me a little bit is that their letters are so short in a yeah. sense, right? Compared to even the Gospels, right? Even though, the, I mean, I think this John is the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, right? And yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful Gospel. But then these letters feel like, man, why are they so short? Um, but also, uh, I think one of the, the cool things about a disciple is that i mean they witnessed the resurrection right they 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 saw it all like face to face and what well once they start writing these letters i feel like a common top uh, topic that that comes again and again and you could i mean one of the questions i have for you is what is the common theme But one of the ones I see in this, I mean, super short letters, but it seems like again and again, they say, guys, be careful with Antichrist. Be careful with false prophets. Be careful with the ones that are uh, false teachers, right? And it's almost like this idea throughout the all, all these four letters, so short, but almost like, hey, guys, don't be deceived. Don't be confused. Yeah. Here it is. This is what the real Jesus is. And like you're saying, these are authoritative 
and they're the real teachings about Jesus. Can you confirm or can you tell me a little more about these themes in these yeah, that's letters? A great, yeah, that's a great question and a great theme to observe. And it's especially uh, relevant to 1 John and then 2 Peter and Jude. Uh, of these seven letters, those three especially are concerned with what you're talking about. So, for example, 1 John. Uh, John writes the gospel, and that's a very long text. And, of course, it's a story about Jesus. It's the true story about Jesus, well, what he taught and what he did. Here in 1 John, John turns his attention to more practical and really pressing issues in local churches So, for example, I think John is writing the letter 1 John from the city of Ephesus. That's in modern-day Turkey. And he's writing this letter to a group of churches around the city of Ephesus. Uh, churches like uh, Loetasia and Philadelphia and uh, Pergamum. Uh, these, you might recognize, letters from the book of Revelation. So John is aware of these churches around Ephesus, and what's happened is there has been a church split. So if you read 1 John chapter 2, he talks about, like you just said, a group of antichrists. Now, what's interesting is he uses the plural. It's not just one antichrist. It's a group of antichrists. And he describes in chapter 2, verse 19, that this group— of Antichrist, this group has left the church. So there's been a church split. There's been friction inside the church. And John addresses this friction, this problem in his letter. And to cut to the chase for First John, the problem is, is this group of people have confessed the wrong thing about Jesus. They don't have the true story of Jesus. They're saying that Jesus only appeared to be a man. He didn't really become fully human, that he was spirit man or something, that he had only some properties of being a man, and they weren't confessing that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And this, and this is the big problem. This is frankly why John calls them antichrists, because quite literally, they are against the true story of Christ. They're against the true teaching of Christ, and, and this is a problem. And John spends a good bit of his letter describing what a real follower of Jesus looks like. What's the real story of Jesus? Well, somebody who confesses that Jesus came in the flesh, uh, that God sent him to be the Son of God in the flesh. Also, uh, real Christians who know the real story of Jesus, they love their brothers and sisters. They love. Uh, even when it's hard to love, right? When, when you disagree with somebody or they're of another political ideology or something or, or they've done something to hurt you, uh, Christians who know the real story of Jesus, they love. They love like God loved. So God first loved us, so we, we, we love others with the love of Jesus. So, yeah, that's, that's John. Second Peter as well, though. Second Peter is concerned about a list of wrong ideas about Jesus. And we can talk more about Second Peter, but one of them is that Jesus isn't coming back. Mm -hmm. So Peter and Second Peter deals with that wrong idea. Uh, a group of people uh, in the early church began to say, hey, it's taking a long time. Jesus isn't coming back. Maybe he's never coming back. Maybe that was a lie. Mm -hmm. And then Peter says, no, no, no. You, you don't understand. You, you're, you're telling time by a different measure, right? With God, this is not taking a long time. God's patient, uh, but he is returning, and he's going to judge when he returns. So there's more there. But, yeah, both John and Peter and, and then Jude as well, they're addressing these kind of wrong ideas about the true story of Jesus. And it needs to be corrected because people's lives are at stake. This, yeah, people are living in a certain way. Uh, from these false understandings, and so they need to they need to correct that. Wow, that is so interesting. And so, in a sense, when you're saying the brothers of Jesus before before they became followers of of Jesus, they were skeptics, right? They're like, "This yeah. is my brother. Like I saw yeah. him grow up." Is, <laughs> is that is that the same? the same thing as being an antichrist, like when you're a skeptic, when you're questioning, or is that totally different? Is that a context no, that's different? Yeah. 
That's a great question. And, and I would say, no, those aren't the same thing. Um, because the brothers of Jesus, like you just said, um, they're having a hard time swallowing the truth about their brother. Um, and they have legitimate concerns and legitimate struggle. And that's not a rejection of their brother. It's, it's, it's just a difficult moment. How do we absorb? How do I come to terms with the fact that my brother, uh, the person that I know from growing up in my home, has a special call of God? In fact, not just a special call, but is God incarnate? That, that's a tough thing to swallow. But, but it's after the resurrection that they've got evidence now. They've had an experience of Jesus dying and, and being raised from the dead by God that they see now there's, I, I can't have the skepticism anymore. I have enough information. So they actually become Christians. The antichrists, they have seen and heard the whole story of Jesus and they are rejecting part of it. They are arguing. And in, in fact, in first John, we might call some of these people Gnostics. That might be a little, little uh, later on. Gnosticism is a thing a little later on. However, this is very much like Gnosticism, where they're denying a key attribute of Jesus. Even after being confronted with the truth of Jesus, they're denying it, uh, and they're rejecting it and walking away. They're separating themselves from the church and fellowship with other believers. So that's a different kind of thing. Struggling, I think all disciples struggle. People who love Jesus deeply struggle. And that's okay. I think in our churches, we need to have space for people to express their doubts or what they struggle with. I don't think God's afraid of that at all. Uh, in fact, uh, I think God is encouraging us to ask questions and to be honest where we're at. Frankly, you know, the church should be the place where we can be most honest and say, not only do I have doubts, but I'm still struggling with sin or I'm struggling with obedience and I need grace that the, the church is the perfect place uh, for that conversation. So yeah, very, very different there, but also the church is a place of truth, right? So if somebody is just saying Jesus isn't who he said he was, uh, we shouldn't believe the Bible or uh, grace actually means you have to work for your salvation or something that, those are those are wrong teachings, and so there has to be a moment where, like in First Peter or uh, sorry, Second Peter or First John, where an authority says, "Wait a second, that that's not the true story." Uh, we, we need to be on the same page. So yeah, that's a distinction between doubt and struggle, and then just outright rejection, such that John would call this group of people antichrists. That's so good to clarify those terms. Um, and you know, I'm I'm kind of bringing this a little bit to to the nowadays. Like, what does that have to do with today? And as you mentioned, you know, our churches. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking my church here, but in in the general sense, I'm thinking like Christianity. And when you were writing the book, you mentioned these are the Catholic epistles. And when yeah. I think Catholic, I'm thinking, oh, the Catholic Church and the Pope yeah. and a very. I mean, even yesterday, I visited the San Juan Capistrano basilica yeah. and i'm yeah. in this place i mean it's so beautiful it's pretty uh but it's a way different tradition than mine right where images are everywhere and uh i mean yeah, there's right. there's beauty in in the architecture and everything but it's a complete different tradition right or i mean it has some elements that are similar but uh can you tell me a little bit about like first what does it mean like this this these letters are the Catholic epistles and how are they different from, you know, a Christian church or a, you know, a yeah. Ex yeah. Excellent question. And I, I, I've been to San Juan Capistrano as well with my kids when we were doing the mission studies and it's a beautiful place and it's a place of solitude as well to go and to pray and uh, appreciate it very much. So let me be very clear about that word Catholic. Uh, so if, You can think of Catholic in one sense, the Roman Catholic Church. And as you're saying, that's a, a whole church tradition that we could talk about. Uh, I don't come from that tradition either. Uh, I come from a Protestant uh, church tradition. When I use the word Catholic, I'm using it in its ancient sense. Uh, and it just means universal, Catholic. It comes from a Greek word that means universal. 
Uh, and these letters are called Catholic epistles, or you could call them general letters, because they have a general audience. So, for example, when Paul writes to the church at Corinth, that's a specific audience. Or Paul also writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy, that's a specific audience. But when James writes, he addresses his letter to the 12 tribes who are dispersed. Or 1 Peter addresses his letter to all Christians in Asia, Bithynia, Cappadocia, uh, in, in this large area. So when I use the word Catholic, all I mean is uh, that these letters are addressed to a broad audience, uh, not like Paul's letters addressed to a very specific audience. And I'm using the word Catholic uh, because the ancient church started calling these letters Catholic epistles. So uh, in the very first couple of hundred years in the early church, um, these, these letters started to be called by this label, Catholic epistles. And James through Jude were always like collected together. And you can see this title being used in, in early church sources. So I'm trying to suggest to, the, to us today, w- we can call these Catholic epistles and we can appreciate them as a group of letters, kind of like we appreciate Paul's group of letters, because these group of letters tell us about the true story of Jesus and about how we should live. So it really has nothing to do with Roman Catholicism and more just a a distinction that these letters had a general audience. And this is what they were called in the early church. Does that help? That, that helps me. That gives me, uh, yeah, it helps me understand that they are universal and Catholic means it's referring to the audience that they were written. So it's a general audience. Right. So I think that's, that's clear versus like you're saying, like Paul, it's even the name of the, the letter is to the people he's addressing it to. Right. So first Timothy is for Timothy. So that makes sense. And I think as I'm trying to think of the of the churches now, like you even mentioned, you know, Roman Catholicism, you mentioned, you know, I come from the Protestant tradition and I mean, there's so many branches, maybe we could say of Christianity nowadays or even branches out of Christianity. Some people know right now there's a big uh, buzzword that some people are saying progressive Christianity. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I would like to kind of like take a few of these terms from the Catholic epistles, like from this authoritative, uh, the real teachings about Jesus and apply them to our modern day and age. Like are these uh, like, what are the tools that these letters write about? You, you already mentioned one, like uh, Jesus came in the flesh, right? Are there things that we can nowadays realize? Okay, if this is, if there's a church even that claims to be Christian um, that doesn't ascribe to these real teachings, could we say that's a, a I mean, a heretical church or a non-Christian church? Uh, how do we identify those in our day and age? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and what counts as Christian? What counts as Christian? Like you mentioned progressive Christianity, or there's even a movement right now called ex-evangelical or the idea of people deconverting mm. from a kind of evangelical faith. And so, yeah, it's, it's all that can be confusing. Um, but I would say, and, and what the Catholic epistles are saying is th- we have to appeal to the true story of Jesus. There's like an anchoring point mm. that these letters are pointing back to. Paul's doing something similar. He does it in his own way. But, for example, First Peter uh, and Second Peter and First John, they are all claiming to be apostolic. They're saying, look, we know the true teaching about Jesus. We know the true story of Jesus. And for like we've said in First John, part of that tr- true story of Jesus is that he came in the flesh. And if, and if we deny that, we're denying something essential about Christianity. Whatever, you know, whatever kind of church that you're in or tradition, whether it's Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or Protestant or you call yourself progressive or conservative, for it to be Christian, uh, John is saying, you need to confess that Jesus came in the flesh, that he was a real human being, that he took on our nature. 
Why is that so important? Because if Jesus didn't become a human being, then his death wasn't for human beings. You see how that works? Like, so the gospel doesn't work if Jesus wasn't fully a human being. But on the other hand, all these letters are claiming that Jesus is God. He's divine. He's not just human. He's also divine. And think about it this way. If just a human being died for you, then it doesn't save you from your sins. It doesn't actually accomplish anything. But if God is giving himself for you so that you might be rescued from punishment, you might be rescued from sin, that actually accomplishes something. So notice, that's central to being a Christian, to understand the right thing about Jesus. Uh, and, and, and these letters go on to say other things, like uh, another idea that we already mentioned in 1 John, but we see it in James, we see it in 1 Peter, this idea of love, loving others. Um, and, and John is specific. We've been loved by God, therefore we must love others. So central to being a Christian is loving your neighbor, Lo- loving your neighbor as yourself. In fact, James even quotes the Old Testament, Leviticus 19.2, love your neighbor, or uh, no, uh, uh, Leviticus 19.18, uh, Leviticus 19.18, James quotes, love your neighbor as yourself. This is a characteristic of all Christians. And I mean, you, you know, probably better than I, we're living in a moment where there's a lot of hatred. There's a lot of division. Uh, online, social media, you see people arguing. You see Republicans and Democrats. You see progressives and conservatives, people who are for a vaccine, people who are against the vaccine. There's a lot of division. And Christians have been a part of that. And so I think the Catholic epistles are calling us to repent from divisiveness, to repent from, James would call it double-mindedness. You know, look at James 1.8. You know, the double-minded man is unstable in all that he does. Uh, that's kind of double-mindedness, I think. Um, when we're letting the world and maybe the debates of the day draw our hearts away from what Scripture is telling us is true about Jesus. And so the Catholic epistles are calling us to love, not Not love from our own power and strength, but love with the love of God, love with the love of Jesus. Even people who are very different from us, maybe even people who aren't Christians, who don't believe like us. That's a key characteristic of Christians that they they love. In fact, Jesus says in the Gospels, they will know that we are Christians by our love. They will know us by our love. There are other themes as well, but those are are really central. What we believe about Jesus and and how we love. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so good. What we believe about Jesus and how we love are essential to yeah. the teachings of Jesus, to who he is, to what he taught. And we can see it throughout these four um, authors in the New Testament. And I guess, um, well, there's a part where you're talking about Peter, almost like, well, we have to to put ourselves in like the mystery, like unboxing a mystery because... Uh, Peter is making some declarations about, I guess, people that secede, right? People that left the church, like you said. Yeah. And, but he doesn't say what they taught until he starts saying uh, kind of like the, the opposite or the true teaching. And then with the true teaching, therefore, we can say, oh, okay, this is probably what they were claiming that was false. But he never says this is what it was that was false. Can you tell me a little bit about... Uh, those things that Peter was mentioning? Because, I mean, first, I think it's fun that for whatever reason, like he didn't clearly say this is what they're teaching and it's wrong. Yeah. He said, no, this is what is right. Yeah, and I use the analogy of um, like listening to one side of a telephone conversation. Say you're in Starbucks and you're having your coffee and you're mm-hmm. reading your Bible or something and you listen to this conversation next door and and all of a sudden you think, whoa, that sounds interesting, man. What's going on in that conversation? Yeah. What's the other person saying? Uh, so second Peter is a lot like that where you're hearing Peter's response. Uh, so you kind of have to guess at what, what is he, uh, responding to? And I think that you can clearly see a couple of things in second Peter. Number one, uh, at the very beginning of his letter in chapter one, he says, 
we are not following cleverly contrived myths when we tell you about the power and coming of Jesus. So you can kind of tell, oh, a group of people think that the apostolic teaching about Jesus's powerful coming is a, a myth. It's made up. Uh, and I think when when Peter says the power and coming of Jesus, I think he's saying the second coming, that, that Jesus is going to come again in power. Because then he uses this interesting illustration of the transfiguration. So this is a moment in the Gospels where Jesus goes up onto a mountain. Peter, James, and John, those three disciples that are really close to Jesus, they go up with him. And Jesus reveals some of his glory. And there's a voice from heaven that says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Uh, listen to him. Um, and so that is evidence about who Jesus really is. He is human and he is divine. I mean, it's kind of like on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus does this Superman kind of moment where he's like, do you want to see the S? Do you want to see? And he's like, here it is. And then, he, you know, I'll show you my superhero nature. And then you know, closes it back up. And the disciples are, oh my gosh, this is the glorious Jesus. He's, he's powerful. He's the Lord God. We worship him. And so Peter in, in second Peter is saying, guys, we saw Jesus's glory when he was here among us. We know when he comes again, he will come in that full glory and power. So believers take heart this isn't made up. This is going to happen. Jesus is returning in power. Those who don't believe, beware. Beware. This is not made up. Because the next thing Peter deals with in chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, is the denial of judgment. I think it's pretty clear by 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, that this group of people not only are skeptical about apostolic teaching, but they're also arguing, man, judgment's just not going to come. I can live however I want. There's no judgment. No, look at me, man. You know, I, I can do this horrible thing and nobody judges me. Uh, there's no eternal judgment. God's not judging me. He's not going to strike me down if I, you know, commit this, this particular sin or something. And that Peter says, whoa, wait a second, man. Ha have you not read the Old Testament? And Peter says this, look, if God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, if God judged the world in the flood, uh, if God judged the angels that rebelled against God, if God judged in all of these cases, don't you think he's going to judge in your case too? And Peter also makes the comment for the believer to encourage them. Hey, in the midst of judgment with Noah and the flood, guess who was saved? Noah was saved by God's grace. Or Sodom and Gomorrah, when God's judgment came down, look who was saved, Lot. Lot was saved. So Peter is making this really gospel argument that God will judge. God will return to judge. And that's a heavy, difficult thing to hear. But in the midst of judgment, there's mercy. There's rescue. But how do you know you're bound for judgment or bound for rescue? What do you say about Jesus? Is he the one you're clinging to as your rescuer? Then then like Lot and Noah, th there's rescue. But if you're like an antichrist in 1 John, if you're rejecting Jesus, if you're saying, I don't need him, I can do this on my own, th that's when someone is in, in danger of judgment. And so Peter is dealing with those false teachings, saying, no, Jesus is coming in power. He is going to judge. And, and the last one, even though it feels like he's delaying, hmm. I mean, this, this is the argument against Peter. Look, um, Jesus said he was going to come back, and it's been a long time, so I doubt he's ever going to come. He's, he's taken too long. Has, has he forgotten? Peter comes back with this argument, and he says, man, don't you realize that God delaying the return of Christ is compassion and is forbearance and is mercy? Do you really want him to come back? Because he, he's going to come back in judgment. But the delay in return, number one, it's already totally in God's time. There is no delay. But number two, don't you realize this is merciful? It's, it's extending a more, more time 
for people to respond to the gospel. So shouldn't we worship God and thank him for his right timing, that Jesus returns at the right time, and he's graciously allowing time for human beings to interact with the true story of Jesus and to come face to face with those claims that Jesus is 100% man and 100% God, and he is rescuing those who follow him, and he's bidding us come, come and check me out, come follow me. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how Peter, like listening on the other side of the phone, uh, we get Peter's response loud and clear. But those are probably the the issues, and those are issues of today. I mean, people live like that today. There's skepticism today, and so I think Peter is is very relevant uh, both to the doubter and to the Christian who's struggling uh, to want to know Jesus more, to be more faithful, and to to live to live like Christ calls us to live. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so helpful. Um, and I mean, it's so relevant to today. And I'm, I almost want to go so many different directions into kind of like trying to apply this to today. But one of the first things that strikes me is that this is people that were like somehow already connected to to the community of the church. Right. Rather than I can I can almost like understand skepticism coming from outside the church and saying, I don't believe or Jesus is a myth or denying judgment or even, you know, Jesus is taking too long. Uh, like again and again, we hear this thing, right? Oh, Christians have been saying that Jesus is coming back for years and years and years. And look, we're still here. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I understand that part when it's outside of the church. My almost like bigger conflict is. And it's what they were experiencing. Like these are people that are already in the community of the church, or that left the community of the church because of these same reasons. How do do how do we deal with that? Like nowadays, like where do you see this happening in today's uh, in our churches today? Yeah, that's right. That's that's a good observation, and that's right. So uh, something about Second Peter and Jude, and then maybe I'll and then I'll turn to, you know, today. So second Peter is dealing with a group of skeptics who have grown up in the church. So it's exactly the scenario that you just talked about. And that's troubling. How is it that people can grow up in the church and have this much pushback, you know, this much doubt? Interestingly, when you turn to Jude, that really small letter, Jude is also dealing with wrong teaching. It's actually more in Jude, wrong living. So Jude is dealing with people who are living in a way that is contrary to the gospel, contrary to the true story of Jesus. But in Jude, these people have come from the outside. Mm. They've like infiltrated the church. So perhaps they are the external. They've come into the church. They kind of look like they're Christians. But then you see how they're living and you think, whoa, there is a disconnect here. And I think both of these scenarios are happening in our churches today where um, we want to invite people into our Christian community. In fact, I, I would argue we want non-believers to come to our church services, to hear a sermon, to hear people worship Jesus, to hear people pray and to see what happens in the lives of Christians when they struggle, but when they ask for forgiveness, when they are transformed by Jesus's power, when they're healed, because that's a witness. The, pr the problem is, though, is if, if non-believers come into the church and they stick around and they continue in their non-belief, what, what do we do? How do we navigate that? And I'm just going to say that's probably messy. And, and the early church, it was messy. Um, those non-believers are welcome in the Christian community to like listen, to learn. I would argue like a non-believer shouldn't take communion, you know, because that's a family meal. That's something only Christians do. Non-Christians, of course, shouldn't be baptized because they haven't professed their faith. They, they don't know Jesus. So, so there's a way in which non-believers can be there, but not, you know, participate in the family meal. Uh, so they, they're there, but, but they're also, they realize they're not quite part yet. And so I think it's really important in the church to communicate welcome and also to communicate, look, you can ask your questions here. You, you know, a skeptic can come and listen. Um, but then to also draw a line, not a line of, you know, we don't want you here, but a line of, this is what it means to pass from unbelief into belief. This is what it means to become part of the family. 
you know, you're a friend of the family. We want you to be here. Come eat the food. Come, come listen. You know, you're welcome. That's evangelism in our church. But there's a moment where you become part of the family, where the true story of Jesus is resonating in your heart as true. And then you surrender and say, I want to be a child of this king. I, I want to be part of this family. And I surrender and I follow Jesus. Now I'm giving Jesus my life. And I now can take communion. I can now be baptized. I'm a part of the church. So I think I think that's one way to address this. We don't want the church to slam the door shut and say we don't want non-believers because it's going to, you know, compromise the church. No, the church should always have open doors, always welcome a skeptic, someone who's hurting. I've heard the illustration that the church is like a hospital. Uh, Sick people belong there, you know, broken people belong there. But in a hospital, people are made well most of the time. And, And in a church, that that's like the analogy of becoming part of the family that should be happening. So what's the answer here? So part of it is strengthen our churches, strengthen our churches so that the church knows the truth and is confident in the truth so much so that we don't have to win the argument at the door. You know what I'm saying? People can come in and we can lovingly have a long conversation and hopefully through that conversation about the true story of Jesus and about the scriptures, people will see that's what they want and that's what they believe. And you see what I'm saying? Instead of like winning the argument at the door and keeping people out or, or having the hard stop there, that's hard though. I mean, the church really has to have a strong identity. They have to know apostolic teaching, the true story of Jesus and live that be, be alive in it to have that kind of interaction. Wow, that's that's massive right there. And uh, I, I'm just going to read right here. I have Second John, and it says, If anyone comes to your meeting and does not teach the truth about Christ, don't invite that person into your home or give any kind of encouragement. Anyone who encourages such people becomes a partner in their evil work. And um, yep. Darian, I would love to play like my last thought um, right before we, we can wrap up with, with some phrase you have right here about Jesus. Um, play devil's advocate for our last question, you know, because I mean, this is this is clearly saying it's almost like this idea of like, oh, yeah, Christians are loving. And even this idea that you just said, like, um, you know, like, don't close our doors. But the more like what I'm witnessing right now personally is like I've seen the church online, right? Like I'm an avatar. I see people all the time on Twitter, on Facebook, on, on YouTube comments, whatever you want. Um, and on Instagram, like the other day, for example, like I knew some people who, who are following Christ, they were no bashing on this other person who is related to, to Beto. Right. So it's like, okay, uh, is that, is that, Kind of like this idea of like, no, we're saying this is this is the standard. Is that right to do online? Or is that just almost like saying, hey, you're not loving people well because you don't even know that person that's online that's typing. Yeah. And that sounds totally unloving. So are you a Christian that's supposed to be loving and totally unloving online? Like, how do we wrestle with this on yeah, the that's internet? Great. That's great. And I love that you bring up Second John there. Again, one of the shortest letters in the New Testament. Often... People, even Christians, uh, don't don't read Second and Third John. And all of my talk about keeping the door open and having even non-believers welcome in the church, it sounds like Second John is saying something exactly opposite. Don't fellowship with these people. Uh, don't let them in the church. Here's the key context for Second Peter. I'm sorry, Second Second John though. Second John is talking about missionaries who are either missionaries for Antichrist or missionaries for the gospel. So they're competing missionaries. They're not just non-believers. It's a group of people who are not only believing the wrong things about Jesus, Jesus didn't come in the flesh, but they're actively teaching other people that falsehood as well. John is saying, look, don't offer those false missionaries hospitality. Because if you offer them hospitality, you're basically 
uh, participating in their ministry. And in the ancient world, there were no motels. There were no places for you to go sleep. So you had to sleep in someone's home. And so when you're offering hospitality, you're basically supporting that ministry. You follow what I'm saying? It's not just, oh, here's a non-believer. Let me love them. Let me show them kindness. This is a missionary for the antichrists. Hmm. And, and, and John is saying, don't, don't encourage that ministry. Don't encourage that theology. And there's a practical way you can not encourage that theology. Don't welcome them in your home. Don't uh, support them to stay in your city for several days by opening your house and giving them a bed and feeding them. So that's something very specific that John's talking about. And I don't think that contradicts at all with the stance of the church at being open to non-believers or open to those who are questioning. You know, if if somebody who is teaching, actively teaching the wrong things about Jesus in the church, they need to be confronted. Uh, they, they, they shouldn't have a microphone be, because they're clearly saying something that we know as Christians by apostolic teaching to, to be wrong. That's not who Jesus was. And and okay, we could talk about doubts and skepticism there, but if you're actively promoting that falsehood, the, the church has the authority by the scriptures to say, that's that's not right, and, and we need to address that. Mm. Now, the issue online, you're saying that's, that's maybe less an example of a theology problem, like they're teaching the wrong thing, but they're living in the wrong way. You see this ethic, right? They're not loving. And brother, there's just, number one, I think we have to have patience because we all have moments when we're unloving. We all have moments when our words are not guarded. Uh, the Proverbs say that uh, a rashly spoken word is like a sword, right? You're sticking people with. Um, and and so I think we should be patient with each other and just say, man, I need to communicate to you what you said was was hurtful, was not loving. You know, and give that person maybe the opportunity to see how their words had an effect. And hopefully there is an apology. Or if it's a Christian brother or sister, there's repentance. Oh, man, I repent. Will you forgive me? I shouldn't use my words that way. And if that happens, that's a great moment of Christian fellowship. We, we you know, a wrong was committed. Um, I communicated my hurt. There was repentance and then forgiveness and restoration. That could be a witness That's how Christians live. The world needs to see more of that. I just think it's it's a hard space to do that in online because it's hard when you don't see people face to face. You know, it's easy to say something harsh about somebody or to put somebody down or to slam somebody's opinion when you don't see their face, when you don't see the effect your words have. And and frankly, that's dehumanizing. Like we're, the, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say the internet's bad because it's not. It's a great resource, um, but it has an ugly side to it that that really challenges our humanity and how we're created by God. Uh, and so we need to be careful, uh, especially as Christians, uh, b- because that's an issue. Like we're when when we're not using our words in a loving way. Um, that's a real issue online. And so maybe I'm suggesting one way of approaching that, but I know it's pretty idealistic. What I'm saying is pretty idealistic. That's tough online. So I'd love to hear your thoughts or others thoughts about how, how can we do that online, you know, learn to listen to each other. And then when we've hurt each other to, to ask forgiveness, forgiveness and, and repent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a hard question. I don't know how to deal uh, so much online other than sometimes avoid uh, avoid polarizing or avoid even like sometimes, you know, with, I, I remember back when the COVID thing started with my friends, uh, you know, the vaccination and stuff and we're chatting and I could see things stirring up on the chat. And then I said, Hey man, we gotta talk face to face, you know, as families. Cause I mean, here on the chat, we don't, we don't have, we can't see each other. You know, I'm sure we can come to a conclusion if we see each other's face and say, okay, you know, I agree or don't agree, but at least it'll be different. And everybody agreed, like, yeah, we got to do that. You know, let's let's see each other in person. Yeah, that's a great comment. Get to know each other. And, you know, if you have the option to do it in person, even better. But, but if you, like, live on the other side of the world or the other side of, you know, your country, it, 
send each other an e email or call each other on the phone. <laughs> that's what we use our phones for. We used to, to call each other. That, that, that's a way of getting to know someone else. And that, that could be a better context in which to, you know, love each other and maybe seek understanding. So yeah, those are great suggestions. Mm -hmm. And so interesting, just, you know, at the top of my head, I'm thinking how this is all related. Even the, the Catholic epistles, these letters talk about like the works of the devil. And sometimes when I think of the internet, like Twitter to me is like, I don't even, I post things on Twitter, but I don't interact with people on Twitter. Cause it's like, it, it's almost like your devilish side somehow flourishes There's like, oh, I'm just going to bash or slam somebody or, or no denigrate or whatever. Right. And sometimes, I mean, sometimes there's hope. But if you try to interact, especially in Twitter, it's like, man, you, it doesn't work for that. And I feel like it's just letting the works of the devil flourish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, I, I'm not on Twitter because I just I'm not that hip. Um, uh, but I mean, I don't think the instrument is the. Uh, necessarily the problem. I mean, I hear what you're saying that here, here's what's popping into my mind that anytime we do something without consequences. So like Twitter is conversation without consequences or interacting on Facebook posts. It's, it's conversations without con consequences. You don't see the effect of your words um, and you say things harshly. And so, yes, yeah, sin comes out from that. Yes, of course. Uh, the devil will use our flesh in that moment. There are no consequences, so I can, I'll, I'll do it more harshly. You know, sex without marriage is, you know, sex without consequences or sex without uh, ha having a child, sex without consequences. And look, look what happens when uh, sex without consequences or uh, sex without boundaries. I, I think we could say this about anything. When, when, when we're uh, interacting without consequences or without boundaries, the mischief, the temptation that comes from, of course, uh, Satan, but just comes from our own flesh as well. Uh, that's heightened and, and we're mo more and more likely to fall into that. So, it, you know, I, I hope that there are Christians on Twitter. I hope that there are Christians online more and more, but um, doing so in a way that they know there are consequences to how I interact and I want to be loving in how I do this. And even when I'm wronged, I want to I want to do that right online so that uh, other people can see, oh, yeah, there, there are consequences for how we talk with each other. Um, and, and especially when we disagree with each other, we need to do that well uh, for the sake of our community, let alone for the sake of uh, a Christian community. Yeah. So good comments. Uh, so good, Darian. Man, I'm so thankful for your your time coming on the show and sharing so much light on what these Catholic epistles mean and what they mean to us today. I think, right, not only to the Christ early Christians, but Christians throughout the eras, right? As you yeah. said, they're canon, they're authoritative. If you're going to want to get to know Christ, um, get to know the people that hung out with him, right? The people that yeah. wrote about him, the people yeah. that uh, um, stuck with his teachings. And I I want to connect this. I don't know how, but I'm sure you will be able to. But in page 151 in your book, you say that Jesus was always completely in control when he gave up his life. His life was not taken, but rather he laid down. Um, so I would love to dwell on this as our last thought as we as we wrap up this conversation. Like, even how is this related to to the letters of of John, Jude, Peter? Yeah, it's a good question, and that's a, that's a comment that I made as as I'm thinking about First John. First uh, John uh, talks pretty clearly about how the Father has sent the Son into the world to be the Savior of the world, um, and that's the mission. That's the mission of the Son. Um, his purpose. His mission is to come into the world and to be the savior of the world. So if we see all of the life of Jesus in that context, uh, nothing in Jesus's life was accidental. Nothing was just uh, accidentally happening to him. Uh, Jesus came with this purpose sent by God the Father. And in the Gospel of John, This is what John says elsewhere. So he's, he's saying this in 1 John, but here's what he actually says in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. 
This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. So that's exactly what we see in 1 John. The Father sends the Son into the world to be the Savior of the world. And here Jesus is giving his life. He's laying his life down. Nobody is taking it. Yes, Pontius Pilate has a a role to play in this. Yes, the Jews, end of the Gospel of Matthew, have a role to play in this. Uh, But it's the divine will of God that his son comes into the world as the God-man to die the death that we deserve so that we might live the life that he gives us. That's the gospel. The the gospel is that we are worse than we thought. (laughs) We are more broken than we ever imagined. But the good news is, is that we are more loved than we could ever have hoped. We are loved by Jesus who gave his life for us because he knew we needed him. And whether you're a Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or any stripe of Protestant, this is the Orthodox. This is the true story of Jesus, that God sent him into the world and that Jesus willingly, out of love, out of obedience to his father, out of love for humanity, gave his life so that we might have life. He became poor so that we might be rich. That's how Paul talks about it. This is the exchange that Christianity talks about, my sinfulness for his righteousness. And guys, if we really have experienced that exchange, what should flow out of our heart? What should flow out of our mouth? Gratitude. Gratitude and worship and love for God and overflowing love for others because of what God has done for us. So that I think that sums up the Catholic epistles there. Uh, loving neighbor because we've been loved for by God in this great exchange by Jesus. Wow. So good, Darian. What a way to wrap up our episode. Letters for the church, reading James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1, 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude as canon. We talked about what a canon means. Friends, I recommend this book. If you want to go check it out, it's available everywhere, right? Just go to Amazon uh, here on Cyberspace and you can buy it. Um, and also check out Darian. Darian, do you have a website or something you want to point people to? Yeah, you know, the easiest way to find out more about um, what I'm teaching and all that is just maybe to surf over to Biola's website. Biola is a Christian university in Southern California where I teach. And um, I have a page there. You could just even type Darian Lockett and Biola in, you know, Google search and and that'll come up. But uh, uh, I, I'd be more interested in what are opportunities for you out there to keep learning about the Bible, uh, learn about faith in Christ, uh, learn about the gospel. Uh, that There are resources you can find, uh, you know, at Biola. Uh, I'm sure there are other resources that uh, you might be pointed to through this podcast as well. Uh, but that that's how you might learn a bit more. So thanks for saying those kind things. Uh, I'm grateful to God for just the opportunity to keep studying his word and, and trying to, to grow and, and, and live obediently before Jesus. Love it. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>